board workshop meeting. First, I want to have everyone join me for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United States, United States, States of America and to the, and to the republic, republic, republic for which it stands, stands one nation, one nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible with, with liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. Thanks, everyone. Let's start out with a roll call vote for board members. Uh, Peter? Here. Ben? Here. Nicole? Here. Rocco? Here. Bob? Here. Joan? Here. I'll ask um, Ahmad? Okay. We got a, a full board. So let me read our standard statement. Tonight's meeting has been convened in accordance with the governor's executive order 202.1, which suspends certain provisions of the open meetings law to allow a municipal board to convene a meeting via video conferencing. In accordance with the executive order, the public has been provided with the ability to view and participate in tonight's meeting by computer, smartphone, or telephone, and to view the meeting on the usual cable television channels. The recording of the meeting will be posted on the town website, and a written transcript of the meeting will be prepared and provided at a later date. There has been a roll call of board members, and there is a quorum present for this meeting. <coughs> I've also confirmed with the secretary that this meeting has been duly noticed, and we have fulfilled our legal application legal notice requirements by posting a copy of the notice on the of the meeting on the town's webpage and on the town's bulletin board. And we've emailed a copy of the notice to the media and have confirmation of the legal notices for any public hearings tonight have been properly published, although we have no public hearings tonight. What's up? All right. Uh, tonight's workshop is, uh, is for the Vassar and an Institute to understand what changes they've they've had and encourage everyone to to listen and uh, and offer your thoughts as we go around and try to get get to, to some conclusion and move move along I did want to just quickly mention uh, for those of you on the uh, on the zoom if you could mute yourself um, that would be appreciated I can do it from here and I'm actually going through and doing that now for those that haven't but um, that would be helpful and uh, the chat function is not on for this meeting mm -hmm because it's primarily intended to be an opportunity for the planning board and the applicant to uh, discuss the project. Um, and, uh, and so therefore, there's not a public comment component of this, but of course, you can always submit in writing any comments you have. And this project will be back on a planning board uh, agenda at a future meeting. A public hearing will be continued and so forth. Correct. So, all right. All right, thanks, Mike. Yep. Uh, so I wanted to, we're all anxious to see what uh, changes Vassar is offering and uh, we'll move forward with their presentation. Thank you. Uh, we really appreciate the board's time and uh, making available this special meeting so we can have an opportunity to have a dialogue and work together on this. Uh, as you mentioned, we do have some proposed changes on the project um, given the feedback and also some additional information to share. And I just appreciate the opportunity to work through those with you and get some feedback. So I'm going to share. Some All right. Uh, yep, go ahead, Brian. Can you see it? Yep, yep. We're done. Yeah, I can We're see on the meeting room now. Okay. So we've prepared some materials on about four topics. The lawn, uh, we know that preservation of the lawn has been an important topic for the board and the community. So we wanted to share an update on that. Uh, preservation of the history of Williams. The town board voted not to designate Williams as a town historic landmark, but we have been continuing to explore ways in which we can preserve the history of the building. And so we want to talk about that and share some of those ideas with you. Enhancing community character, this has been part of the feedback that we've been hearing and we've been listening to from the community. So we have some promote proposed enhancements to parking, um, traffic calming measures and some other information around community character that we'll share. And then as part of the project, we are proposing a zoning text amendment. And at the last meeting, we didn't have a lot of time to talk about that. So we wanted to provide an opportunity to talk about any questions you might have about this. So we'll get to that. 
And we want this to be an open dialogue. So as we go through, please feel free to interrupt, ask questions, share your thoughts so that we can just make sure that we are uh, kind of communicating well. All right, thanks, Brian. So with that, I will jump in unless there are any questions. No, nope, move um, forward with your presentation. Great, thanks. So preservation of the lawn, we have discussed the lawn and the importance of the open space and the activities that occurred there. And we've agreed with that from the very beginning. It's why we've cited the building where we did and that tucked into the hill and in the corner of the space to try and preserve as much of the open space as possible. And while we don't have any plans to build on this um, in the future, we've been a little hesitant to restrict future administrations just because of fear of the unknown and what may come. But we have listened to the feedback from the board and from the community, um, had a good conversation with our board, the board of the college, and we agree that this is an important open space for the community and are making the commitment as part of this project to preserve the remaining open space uh, indefinitely. So we've talked a bit about what space is left available. And as I go to the next page, I don't know why that didn't come out very well, but you can see the space essentially all of the Vassar property within the borders that is not part of the, uh, the project will be built will be preserved indefinitely as part of this project. That's, that's a nice and we will put that as, uh, in, you know, the appropriate documents for that. All right, great. That's a nice uh, offer. I think that will. Okay. Uh, so kick it over to Marianne to talk about preservation of the Williams history. Thank you, Brian. Um, and thanks everybody again for this opportunity to have the dialogue, as Brian said, with all of you. It's uh, an important moment for us. Um, we know with the town board's decision not to designate Williams a town historic landmark that preserving the history of Williams remains important in many ways and to many of us. And so we just wanted to share with you some of the ideas we've had to date and um, also let you know that this is an open dialogue and we can talk a little bit more about that around this question. So obviously we have an agreement with the State Historic Preservation Office for several um, you know, items and they're listed here. We will be providing the state with a structure documentation package as requested and as required. We also are providing a photographic record of the building as part of that, again, as necessary by the state. And we are um, preserving and repurposing materials to the extent that's uh, reasonable, um, again, as part of our agreement with the State, state Historic Preservation Office. Um, in addition, we have several other things that we are um, considering and planning to do at this point in time. And as I mentioned, this is not an exhaustive list or nearly a final list. So one of the things we've done is to, out, to make some outreach to the Town Historic Preservation Commission and collaborate with them on their ideas around how we might preserve William's history. So we've begun that conversation and we'll be taking that um, forward now. Um, we are also reusing the, the roof slate material um, where possible and non-structural elements in a variety of ways. For example, um, as interior accessories perhaps, or as elements within the landscaping. And our landscape architect has um, suggested a number of ways in which we can use slate uh, in the landscape that are really quite creative and I think excellent um, opportunities for us. Um, we will also be um, attempting to reclaim wood flooring where possible to use in uh, select casework, uh, un unique pieces of casework or millwork within the, the project. We have contracted with a local artist to salvage items from Williams for an art installation or an art display that will be in the lobby of the project. This is an artist that has worked with the college before, and he does these um, you know, really amazing kinds of installations that use material cult culture to tell a historical story, as well as the current um, moment in time for an institution. So I think this is a really great way that we can, again, add some of William's history into the project. We have completed a digital scan of all buildings of Williams for a virtual 3D rendition of the buildings as they exist today. That's been completed. And we're looking at ways to recognize the history of Williams and its residents within the uh, Institute project. 
So this could be anything ranging from plaques to naming to um, you know, other kinds of didactic materials that would recognize the history of Williams and its residents. As I say, this is not nearly exhaustive and is really a conversation that we will be moving forward with the Town Historic Preservation Commission to um, come up with some additional creative ideas. Is that 3D uh, scan similar to what was done for Notre Dame? It's did. very similar. It's not not quite as um, not quite as mm -hmm. I think high tech, but it's very similar in what it does provide. Uh, Ken can certainly speak to that. It isn't the same uh, laser technology that is there. This is more of a visual representation of what the uh, building looks like, rather than a fully computerized one that the public or anybody like that couldn't use or see. Okay. This is something where more of the public could walk through and visually see in and out of the rooms and see what they look like in, in that type of uh, uh, 3D okay. scan, like a virtual walkthrough. Yep, I did see some of that on, on Google Maps. All right, great. Um, so if there's no questions, um, I will turn it over to, I think to Ken right now, just to talk a little bit about um, some of the, the parking changements and changes we're, we're thinking about and the enhancement to community character. Um, you know, as, as was mentioned, we've listened to both the planning board and to uh, local residents, and we understand that the parking is a concern and is a question, and so we've tried to tackle some of those concerns with what you'll see here. Good evening. Uh, so what you'll see on the screen in color is uh, what is being proposed, and there's a red outline of what was in the most recent design that is was in front of the town prior to the parking layout. Uh, probably the most major shift here is the movement of the parking as well as the drive uh, approximately 137 feet east uh, to align better with Dean Lane to create a more of a T intersection with Dean Lane rather than this uh, lane that comes down from alumni as it is today right into the side of a house across the street the benefits of what we're doing is twofold the daily traffic that that will come in and out are further away from the residences uh closer to the east which will bring in and out of the in and institute and go into the parking lot one of the key components here is the parking management plan that we've submitted reviewed and went back and forth with with the board still basically holds true. Uh, the same number of parking spaces, 60 spaces here, 60 spaces that was proposed before, not utilizing any of the uh, on-street parking that is in that parking management plan. Uh, one of the other components is the lot as it was pr proposed in the northwest corner was about 127 feet from the nearest residence in that direction. We're now moving the, the actual edge of pavement to almost 260 feet away. So it's a substantial movement away from uh, that area. The area you see in green outside of the driveway to the left or west in that area there, that is grading in an on-site stormwater management practice that we're looking to uh, put in there, which enables us to enhance the visual buffer between the project and the actual, the neighbors as well. Uh, we've created a kind of a, a six to eight foot shoulder on the road as it comes down, because that is slightly elevated. As, it, as we all know, the alumni rises, so that rises up to that direction. And that gives us ability to plant some park, some vegetation up high, and then the stormwater practice is a little bit down lower. So that'll give us some more area to plant down low as well to further create a, nicer, a nice buffer in that area along there. Um, that's the main changes uh, with with regard to the two projects uh, from there. I'm going to turn it over to Henry Thomas, one of the other uh, partners in my firm, and we are looking at some of the on-street things we can do for College Avenue as well to enhance the community character. Thank you, Ken. <clears throat> uh, I've been engaged to spend some time looking at uh, College Avenue and 
look at ways that we can start to address some of the concerns that I think everybody's probably readily aware of in terms of the, the travel speeds on College Ave. And uh, we'll call that in general, a traffic calming exercise. And uh, uh, you may be aware that there are any number of different tools in the tool belt that you can use to mitigate traffic speeds. For example, you can see the traffic circle at Raymond Avenue there on the right-hand side of that diagram. That's one kind of a traffic calming uh, tool that can be used. We have very conceptually placed these colored bubbles on the street to, to sort of segment the street into a couple of different ways of treating the cross section of the road and uh, the idea being that we want to create a little sense of friction, if you will. Right now, it's, it's 37 or 38 feet wide, relatively undelineated and relatively flat. So that makes it a very wide open and easy to negotiate at a higher speed than you should kind of a road. Um, so uh, the first, I guess first order of business is to note that between the Raymond Avenue traffic circle and the intersection of Park Road on the west is roughly 1500 feet. So think of it in round terms as a quarter of a mile-ish kind of a space. Uh, and uh, we've got the, the, the five different colors there relate to what we describe on the bottom as five different kinds of treatments. These aren't the only things available, but we, these are the ones that, that we felt were applicable. And basically in the, the street section, there are a handful of components. You have a travel lane in each direction. You have the opportunity to put in parallel parking on one or both sides of the street. Uh, and then one other element that we're going to talk about here is the idea of a center island in selected location. Um, we had we recognize the uh, uh, the significance of or the potential for bicycle traffic, and we we discussed whether or not there were any measures that should be implemented at this point in time or included in here, and we felt like at 1,500 feet it's only a very small portion of College Avenue, and frankly at either east or western end it doesn't link to other bike friendly travel lanes or those kinds of specific improvements. So we have focused our time right now on the idea of reducing traffic speeds and increasing the need for a little more driver attention. So moving from right to left or east to west, you see the darker green envelope or bubble. That is basically right now what we're describing as a major boulevard uh, island, and I don't mean major in terms of scale as much as trying to get the island in the center of the road large enough to be able to put meaningful landscape treatments uh, like trees and other lower growing plant material, but big enough to support tree growth. And that would not be unlike other big boulevards that you've seen. The idea would be that that boulevard would extend from uh, the traffic circle over to the entrance to the in an institute and it would break there for an intersection and at that point the lighter green uh envelope is a what we're calling a minor boulevard which is a slightly narrower on uh, narrower island in which we could do lower level landscape but it would continue to break the road down into a couple of narrower segments for both of those areas we would suggest that there be delineated parallel parking on the in an institute side of the street, the north side of the street. And again, by delineated, we mean simply marked out, painted, designated, so that it is clearly not the travel lane. And, and it also results, can result in more efficient quantity of parking available mm -hmm. Uh, because people are parking between designated stripes instead of on their own by intuition, which tends to be more inefficient because people give themselves more elbow room than they perhaps need. 
beyond that, the blue, uh, the blue bubble is uh, represents sort of what we call a standard street section, and that would be two travel lanes and parallel parking on both sides of the street. And the idea there being, obviously, it's located in between driveways, uh, parking spaces, that is. Um, but the idea is to get as much possible. We understand, you know, we've gotten the feedback already that it's important to maintain as much room for parking on the street as possible. So we've mm -hmm. tried to make that as generous as we can and yet always accommodating uh, people's driveways. The purple envelope represents the idea of a mid-block crossing. Again, because it's 1,500 feet down, if we don't have designated ways of getting across the street, chances are pretty good people will cross wherever they want. The idea of a crossing also gives us an opportunity to manipulate the width of the drive or width of the road to neck it down a little bit, not, not to reduce travel lane sizes, but to bring the curb line in and uh, have a crossing that could conceivably even be a raised crossing. Beyond that to the west, we're talking about again, uh, the similar standard section of travel lanes and parallel parking on both sides of the street. Now down at Park Avenue, is it Park Avenue, Park Road? I'm drawing a blank here. Um, that presently is only a stop on one on the park side, not on the College Avenue side. So kind of the first thing we're thinking is that maybe it makes sense to mitigate that intersection by making it a three-way stop, which just gives cause for, again, reducing momentum down that stretch of the road. Uh, we could also start to manipulate curb lines there to choke that down, uh, much in the way that you'll see in uh, urban intersections when they're trying to green up an intersection and kind of control traffic, you can actually let those curb lines come out as corner islands. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the fifth tool that we, we, we're talking about. None of these, based on the way I've described them, are things such as chicanes or lane shifts and those kinds of things. And, and the, the challenge with those kind of gestures are that they require lots of linear distance and they will erode pretty substantially the available parking that you can have yeah. where you do have parallel parking. So we think these things create some friction as you work your way down the street. And we have a few slides after where we'll show you a little bit of an enlarged look at what those might look like. Yeah. We could flip to the yeah. next slide, okay. Brian. Sounds good. Just a quick question. Uh, how many additional yeah. on-street parking places do you think can fit in there then between park and uh, the, I'll, I'll be honest with you, we haven't looked at it at a level of detail where we've run those numbers. Um, you know, if you took that 550 feet and simply divided it by the by a 22 or 24 feet, you would get a larger number than we could actually accommodate based on driveway locations right. and such. So I just honestly, we haven't run that number to know. Um, so that's something we'll certainly dig into. Uh, but the goal is to maximize, and practically speaking, it should be pretty equivalent to existing with the exception of in the zone of the boulevards where we are using using that lane for an island instead of okay. uh, parking. And the, uh, I believe that the parking management plan presented did not include any of that on-street parking. Is that correct? That, that is correct. Okay, thanks. I have a question. Go ahead, Ben. With, with the parking and the travel lanes and the islands, is the road wide enough for trucks to access also because you're going to have an inn with a restaurant, I believe, and everything? Yeah, we will. And actually, and when we get to the next slide, you'll see how we're sort of conceiving the intersection. But yes, we would have to accommodate inbound and outbound travel in both directions. So, for example, here, you can see that the boulevard on the right ends substantially before the intersection and then the next one doesn't start until afterwards. Ultimately, we would have to run vehicles through there to verify where the ends of those islands are. But the intent is to make that broad enough to, to uh, accommodate that from either direction. 
uh, the radiuses we show are right now standard, you know, 25 feet inside radius on those curves. Um, does that answer the question? I think so. Okay. So in this, this is sort of an enlargement of the intersection area at the Institute and in, and you can see that, and again, this is sort of an approximation that it, we're, we're sort of right across from Dean's Lane. So we also, one of the values or benefits of ending the boulevard where we show it on the right is that it allows left-hand traffic or, or left-hand turning traffic into Dean's Lane and lets them back out as well. Um, and so you can see in the sections below on the right hand side we're showing that is an eight foot wide island and it would have that would be big enough that you could actually grow trees and other colorful landscaping in uh so we think that you know is certainly an improved aesthetic at that end of the street the left hand section is for the what shows the minor boulevard and by minor it's simply two feet narrower so it would support smaller plant material and from a visibility standpoint we wouldn't want that to get too too tall anyway um on the plan view you can also see the parallel parking that's on the, the side the north side of the street um one consideration we're giving here and we just haven't shown it yet is the idea of a crosswalk at this intersection to accommodate uh, you know, crossing at this intersection, which seems to make some great sense in terms of the sidewalks on either side of the street. So our, our general thought at this point is that it probably ends up on the west side of the intersection and possibly goes through the island so that we can have a cutout in the island and the island actually acts as protection for people crossing the street. Uh, the diagram doesn't go far enough to show you, but the other end of that Western Island or the minor Island would be short of the next driveways west of this intersection. So that there's, there's no one that needs to go through the boulevard or through the Island in order to get to their driveway. So that'll be roughly a 70 foot length uh, but it allows the houses at 160 and 162 to turn into their driveways and parking areas. Uh -huh. And, oh, I, one thing I should have mentioned, all of these ideas that it represent in general maintaining or improvements within what is the current roadway width. It's generally about 37 feet more or less. We don't have hard survey yet, but the idea is that we probably need 38 feet to do these things. Um, but more or less that existing curb line would be what we would replicate uh, with any new curbing. Uh, and that the shoulders and the walkways, the sidewalks in the right of way would be maintained as is. And that we would avoid any of our hard improvements with uh, any conflicts with storm drains, utility poles, manholes, light poles, et cetera. So that this is really a street project and doesn't unfold into an infrastructure project, if you will. Uh -huh. So any other questions before we move to the next slide? No, oh, sounds good, thanks. Okay. Um, this is just a little bit of imagery because I know when people think of a boulevard, they can think of a major traffic or major collector road kind of a situation or a commercial street uh, of some kind. And the idea is that we want it to be very quiet and, and, and relatively simple. And the scale of these is consistent with the kind of thing that we're talking about here. And we think that the boulevard in the limited areas that we're talking about can be compatible with a residential character. Uh, our intent would be that the curbing would be uh, comparable to the existing curbing, which is a sloped asphalt curb Ouch. with a granite curb or concrete curb uh, to just again, visually make it as quiet as possible. Yeah, fire trucks generally don't like the granite curbs. Thing. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Couldn't hear that. 
just saying generally granite curbs are you know wind up with sharp edges for fire trucks and other vehicles so correct and and right they're un they're unforgiving whereas the uh, sloped asphalt will definitely be more forgiving uh -huh. uh, just to interrupt you real quick henry i i met with mike welty and uh mark pfeiffer on the street to talk through these preliminarily just conceptually just to make sure that we weren't uh going down a path that mark wouldn't uh be able to work with as the town highway superintendent and he was uh generally in in agreement with the ideas that we've proposed uh one of the subjects was just that was the uh curbing and stuff to be consistent with what is there which is currently a an asphalt curb uh, so that it maintains that same character of what is the, the neighborhood and the roadway that is there. All right. Thanks, Ken. Yep. Okay, Brian, you can move along one. Okay. At the, and again, where we showed it on that overall plan was just a general idea of roughly mid block. Uh, ultimately, we had to really zoom in there and determine where this crossing ought to go. But the idea would be that uh on the left and right you've got the standard street section with travel lanes and parallel parking but where we have that mid-block crossing that we would either you know bring that curb out so again we create a little friction by visually narrowing the road even though the travel lane stays the same but we bring the we bring the pedestrians closer to each other in terms of the crossing and reduce the actual crossing distance so there's a couple of different things that are happening there. Visually, you can see that it's it's narrower. Vertically, we would recommend that we elevate that crossing and have a speed table. It's not a speed hump. It's a much softer transition up and over, but it's enough of a change that you wouldn't, you know, fly through there at a high speed without uh, regretting it the first time anyway. Um, it also gives us cause to put pedestrian signage and markings on the pavement um and uh creates an intended place for people to cross uh so we think you know that could be done you know with striping or striping and curbing but but the main effort is to uh make it visible and designated and if you go to the next slide brian it's actually the same image but the thing we were trying to point out with this is that the blue the blue box sort of represents what we call the typical street section, which is two travel lanes and the parallel parking. Uh, and, and again, that will be situational because there will be a driveway opening here and there that we have to accommodate. So uh, as a diagram, we showed it nice and neat, but there may be missing teeth in here in terms of allowing people to get into their properties. You can go one more. And at the intersection, um, this would be what you see in the plan below. We'd implement the stopping measures on College Avenue. So both sides of the intersection would stop, have a stop bar, stop signage, and uh, a crosswalk. In this case, it, we would recommend being in the intersection that it would be an on-grade crossing. So you'd have a ramp on either side, but it again provides a good, clean, designated way to get across the street but it reduces the width of that intersection down to 24 feet, which is a normal full roadway cross section without any parking on it. But again, it provides some resistance to, you know, unmitigated speed and unmitigated travel. So, and again, in the cross section, you see stop sign, the, the curb ramps, and you get, you can see from the two gentlemen that we have in that cross section are on either side on the, the uh, existing sidewalks. Mm -hmm. So we think there can be some measures there and, and all told, all of those combined, you know, each adds to the level of attention that's required to drive in this block. If there is practically no, you know, hard physical resistance to make it an unusable street. It just uh, requires that people be more obedient to the traffic controls that are there. Um, so again, there are other tools. These that we think are the appropriate kinds of tools. They can happen independently or they can happen as a group. 
or they can happen as in an a la carte way. Uh, but really, this is just our first first take at it, and obviously, it does not reflect a collaboration with town staff, engineering, and highway in, in detail. Um, but we think it's 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 a good prime of the pump in terms of the conversation. So, it, it, these are looks questions good. on the subject. As you say, it looks good overall because I, I think that's been one of the complaints of the neighbors that the traffic is pretty fast on that road. Um, right and so we've already we've already you know gotten that feedback directly in fact uh about parking and speed um and so we've we've heard that things we've started to account for it even in this diagram but but certainly would look forward to accounting for it even in more detail as we move forward about how wide is that uh are you thinking the proposed boulevard island is is that like 10 feet or something or, uh, uh the it's an eight foot wide island at the major boulevard okay. Okay. so um and that by and, and again all of these numbers for the widths that we show i think are subject to you know critical conversation um in this case with a 38 foot wide overall width to get the eight feet you have 11 foot lanes for that section once you go through the intersection, it opens up to 12 foot wide lanes and a six foot island. Um, but I think all of those numbers would be things that we'd have to, you know, have a critical conversation with, you know, highway about in yep. planning. Yeah, I like the idea it can accommodate some trees that it's wide enough for that. Yeah, I think conceptually when, as Ken alluded, we, when we were out there with Mark Pfeiffer just to look at it, I mean, first of all, you don't have to stand out there very long to see cars going much faster than the speed limit um but uh the uh you know i think conceptually he he, he was in favor of of these kinds of um you know design ideas as ways to help you know give drivers the idea that they need to slow down and and to make it a safer street all, all around um and and you know obviously he's also concerned with uh, the maintenance and with the snow removal and those types of things yeah, so i i bet um you know it was good to have that kind of discussion even early on, um, and so if this is something that ultimately gets incorporated into the site plan, we'll obviously we'll, we'll bring him in in more detail. Uh, again. I mean, it'd be great to get numbers eventually, but I'd like the idea of adding all the additional on-street parking that's not counted in the plan because that you know, allows more people to to use you know that are using the restaurant there or whatever to or even uh, visitors to to houses there, et cetera, to, to use those parking spaces. My only concern is this this seems like this is con this is going to congest this street more by adding things in the middle like that. Did you guys talk to the residents they want this on the street? We did have we, di we have had dialogue and I'm sure there will be more. Um, where these boulevards are there there are no driveways on the south side of the street there's dean's lane is the first left hand turn and then beyond the minor boulevard is where you have the next driveways on the left so in terms of their direct turning movements i think we could readily accommodate that uh there have been some conversation we just in fact earlier today we had discussed a longer boulevard but we've since understood that we need to reel that in a little bit to avoid some hardships there uh, yeah absolutely you have a lot of driveways there you have people that already park on the street and i think that was the problem that we initially had with this was that you have a lot of people already parking on the street and then you're going to add to that with this institute and this hotel so adding more things to the street like islands i just think that's really going to constrict it I'm not opposed to the whole thing. I definitely think that there should be a three-way stop at Park Ave and College Ave. I feel like that should have been there a long time ago. Um, but some of these things I think you have to be careful with because you want to put that parking on there for that hotel and institute. You already have people parking on there that live there in those houses and whatnot. So I don't know, but that's my two cents. I just think, you know, Nicole, that putting you know, by striping and all that helps organize the parking so it's more efficiently used and again more cars can fit in that way 
you just have this nice, beautiful, wide road right now. That That's my only concern. I don't think you, you have to be careful not to constrict the movement is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. That's all. Yep. Nicole, Nicole, just to interject there too, part of our concept and thought behind it was a little bit of the constriction because of the speed. Um, it'll make it a better travel way for pedestrians and, and people using it. I, I don't, I've parked on it and when you park on it, because they're so fast, you tend to want to park over the curb so that you can actually get out of your car and not get clipped by the guy driving down the road at 50 miles an hour. So the idea by putting striping on it, just like on Raymond, um, having those designated spaces, it slows the vehicles down a little bit. It doesn't stop the movement of vehicles where, as Henry pointed out, we're not gonna restrict anyone's driveways going in and out. We're not looking to do any of that. All we're looking to do is kind of make it feel smaller so that people slow down. Yep. and then create a little more organized parking to add some space along those side streets. I hope that helps a little bit more clarity. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, a little paint uh, helps helps visually narrow it in people's minds as they're driving by. Yeah, well, as I said before, True. right now there's no doubt people are flying down that road, and, and you have every incentive to do so because it is so wide and, and there's really very little traffic there, so this would be uh, one way to mitigate against that. Mm -hmm. I've got a couple of questions, if I can ask. Yep, yep. Sure, go ahead, Bob. Um, I just want to <clears throat> get straight in my mind. The islands are where they're going to be along uh, College Avenue. Are there any driveways that would be, when they come out, they hit the island? Or do they always have a way to come out of the driveway and go left or right, depending on where they want to go? No, there. yeah, there will be no... For example, in either of these green boxes, there are no driveways that come out into the island itself, and the island on the left will end before the first driveway. Okay. So, so from from here to the right up to Raymond, there are no other curb cuts other than Dean's Lane. And these, um, I forget what you called them. They're uh, not fully grown speed bumps, but some kind of, right, right. you know, sort of a hint of uh, slowing down. Are, is that um, going to impact the clearing of the roads when it snows? Uh, generally, these uh, the the distance over which you slope up and slope back down is variable, and it can be anywhere from six to ten feet. So that's fairly soft in terms of the brake. Uh, it should be readily plowable okay. and and it won't you you won't pull it up or rip it off as you might a speed bump that is shorter and more abrupt. Mm -hmm. um, I think Ken you had yes. some and Bob we, when we talked to Mark Pfeiffer about that that was exactly one of his uh, comments was you know we just have to work with him on the design to make sure it's not an abrupt change in the elevation so that his plows get hung up on it. Um, and that it's more of a gradual change up, like Henry's describing, more like almost a raised crosswalk feel. Um, it's gonna come up to where they cross and then go back down. But what it does do is, is for vehicles, slow it down, um, but it should not impact him with regard to his plowing and maintenance in that regard. Okay, thanks. That yep. good. Yeah, not, not as abrupt as like Oakwood Common. Right, right. Yeah, no, that, that I would say of all those items on that were mentioned, that was the one that uh, Mark, I think, probably had the, you know, <laughs> most question about. And, and yep. I, I'm sure, you know, again, this is, uh, I believe, Ken, that, the, you know, the, this is meant to be conceptual at this point and something that Correct. would be evaluated, you know, in more detail if this were included in there. Mm -hmm. Cycling. Yeah, I'm not sure where it was, but I had, I, I do believe I've driven on something like that where you, where you slope up to it. Yeah. And back down, it's, it's over, it is over a long distance. So you just have to work that out. Yeah. yeah. The engineering. Yeah. Uh, this is Marianne. I just wanted to add two things, if I may, on, um, you know, a couple of points that were made. Uh, just to reiterate what Henry said about the length of that light green box, um, some some individuals who I think might be on the Zoom have seen it in which that was a much longer green length. And that has been shortened based on 
the input from residents so that seventy foot section is significantly shorter than it was originally so this is really iteration two already on these diagrams so i just wanted to point it point that out in case people were you know confused about the change i also wanted to just note something about the plantings in the islands which i know for some are just a maintenance nightmare but they also add a layer of greenery between the north and the south side of the street and although we have street trees planted on the south side you know to some degree now and there are there will be plantings along this the side with the um the in there this added layer of greenery and shrubbery in the middle of the street will really add a nice layering effect from north to south and also can add color at various times of year so and shade etc so it's really an opportunity to i think create a much more uh natural looking street and also a more more pleasant residential feel marianne can i ask a question sure about the greenery would vassar be maintaining that greenery they do such a great job with what they do now you know i'd have to turn to brian to answer that for for real because it's his staff that have to do that but yeah my understanding is that we would be maintaining this as we do the um the along raymond avenue okay all right thank you yes yes that's right we vassar would maintain that 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 was a discussion with mark as well and and we yes it was was. talking through that uh, maintenance on the on the boulevard area. I, I wanted to just have Brian go back to this because I know this question had come up. Um, as you can see, the break between the dark green and light green, that is actually the first driveway uh, on Raymond Avenue, and that's the first break in the island. So there's nobody that has to make a U-turn to get to their driveway. There, no one has to make any turning movements other than a, if you're coming from Vassar and you were going into your driveway. If you're the first house you'd be able to go after that light green section, make a left into your drive. If you're going into Dean's Lane and any one of the houses that are accessed from Dean's Lane, you'd be able to make the left right into Dean's Lane in that direction as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't want to cause any artificial blockages of, of driveways. Correct. So. Correct. All right, thanks. So before we go on, uh, just a quick, we I think I've heard a little bit of mixed feedback and just so that we're all on the same page as we go into this, is this something that the planning board finds valuable as an addition to the way we think about the project or um, don't bother spending your time on that. We'd like to talk about other things, uh, you know, cause we, this is intended to be a benefit to the community more so than the project. And, and it, I mean, obviously making this road nicer is, is a benefit for everyone, but just wanted to get some kind of clearer feedback on whether we should continue to enhance this and move forward with these ideas. Um, um, I, for one, I like it, um, but I am curious to hear the community feedback at the public hearing. I think that it does um, aesthetically, I think it helps. And also I think it sort of softens the appearance of the inn if it can be, you know, if that there's trees in the, in the island, I, I, I like it. So that's my feedback. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other board members have comments? Uh, this is Rocco speaking. Uh, uh, I think I have to echo what uh, Joan uh, had sa ha has uh, said, but I also uh, am a little uh, concerned with the points that uh, that uh, Nicole brought up. I think uh, we need uh, the uh, the community feedback. I like the approach here because I think it would add a lot of value, uh, and and obviously a lot of, of uh, aesthetics uh, to that area. Uh, but the community feedback uh, would be crucial. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, thanks, Rocco. Thank you. Yep, um, and I, as I've said personally, I like the beautification of it, the additional landscaping, as uh, as Joan mentioned, will will uh, soften the, the trees, especially will soften the, the view from those of the inn from those houses, and the uh, the extra parking, as I've mentioned, uh, stripe, striping the parking to be more efficient. Uh, utilized will uh, be a plus. Anyone else yep. on, the, on the street plan before we move on? All right, thanks, Brian. Thank you. 
Great, thank you. Um, so we're gonna move here to um, a topic that I know some of you have heard about and, and um, others probably have not, but the question comes up you know, frequently about what, what the college is planning for the north side of campus and why in, uh, this project hasn't been located there. And I just wanted to share with you what our strategic direction is um, and our ideas for that, that north edge. And so this is really a conversation about our offices of admission and career education. So uh, next bullet, please. Um, who's, yeah, thank you. So um, the offices of admission and career education were identified as um, key priorities, investors priority and planning process this was a process that we went to went through about I would say two and a half years ago, um, but it's not it these these offices have not been um, discussed discussed only since then. Um, certainly, back in 2014, when we hired a consultant to t undertake a set of uh, campus planning studies for the college, uh, he he noted that the office of admissions was in the wrong building and in the wrong place on campus. Um, since that time, we've been evaluating and discussing a variety of solutions for how we might so better support the offices of admission and career education. Um, and ultimately, next bullet, please. Um, the college had decided that the most effective solution is really to combine these two offices, which are now separated on campus, into a single new building on the north edge of the campus. And I'll show you that on the next slide. Um, or maybe the one after. So why the north edge of campus? Uh, you might be asking yourself, what's special about that location? And we uh, truly believe that the north edge pro provides us with real opportunity for both of these functions. First of all, there's available parking on the north edge in the form of the north lot, which is our visitor's parking lot. And there's enough space to expand that lot and add additional parking in that area. Uh, furthermore, um, it's an easy to find location. It's close to the edge of campus rather than buried in central campus as these two functions currently are. And in addition, there's an opportunity at this location to create a gracious entry by rethinking that parking and rethinking the circulation of roads and pathways on the uh, campus side. And in addition, we can reimagine the college's relationship to the community. At this point in time, that edge feels very much like a back of the campus. It's the back of uh, Jewett House, which is one of our residence halls. It's the back of Jocelyn, which again is another residence hall. By really um, you know, thinking about a new building in this location, we have an opportunity to, in, in many ways, create a new front to the campus. And that's the intention with this um, project here. Um, next, please. And likewise, it activates the north, north edge of campus. We are bringing visitors to this area, visitors close to Arlington, um, that will not feel like a back anymore, but feel very much like an intentional edge with uh, the neighboring community on College View. And of course, with, there is a synergy with the Arlington Business District, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. But again, bringing visitors to campus in this location close to Arlington, there's a natural synergy there. So here's a map of campus just to orient you. The Raymond Avenue is you can identify down the left-hand side. College View is on the, the top of the screen. Um, our admissions office is currently located in the red square there, right behind main building. You can see that's far from most parking. It's also very difficult for visitors to find. If you've ever tried to do it yourself, you've probably gone in a few circles before you've gotten there. Um, the career education or career development, as we sometimes call it, is currently located in the first floor of main building in that red rectangle there. And this yellow circle is where we are planning, you know, generally to locate our new structure. So on the north edge, um, closer to um, the functions in that area. As I mentioned, it's close to the north lot, which you can see here. Um, that's the north parking lot. And again, there's room for expansion in that area. It's also close to the north gate of campus, which is a major entrance and exit to the campus um, right now. As you all know, the main gate itself is one way in. And so it, you can't exit onto Raymond through main gate. And this um, exit entrance here on College View tends to be a very heavily used um, entrance and exit to the campus. Um, so this location is also close to college dining. As you can see here, this is our dining hall, our Gordon Commons. 
So visitors who come to admissions, prospective students and their families um, can go straight over and get a bite before their campus tour. Um, folks who are coming to the Career Education Center, maybe these are potential employers, likewise could go to Gordon Commons for a meal, or if they wanted to, they could go into Arlington and get a cup of coffee, which is right up there on the corner, um, get another uh, bite to eat if they're still hungry, whatever it happens to be. And likewise, it's fairly close to the Institute and Inn, which um, is a place where some people might be planning to stay while they're visiting the college or while they're trying to hire somebody for their firm. So that's kind of the idea. This, build, this building site, um, again, is, is something that we've identified as you know, really solving the, the problems that we currently have with the career education and admissions um, located where they are now on campus and enhances not only their ability to do the work that they need to do so well and be an inviting um, entrance to the campus, but I think will also enhance that streetscape and that connection with the, the local community and the local businesses. So on the next slide, I show, um, oh, before we get there, I forgot, I'm sorry. Um, one of the questions that might be on your mind as um, planning board members is the impact on institute parking because you'll recall that our overflow parking had a solution in which the, um, the overflow parking would take place on a grassy field um, in this general area of campus that we're talking about. We are completely committed to um, honoring the letter of any agreement with the town around overflow parking. And I think as you'll recall, recall we had another solution which included the South Lot um, overflow area as well. And so we will um, be evaluating um, this potential impact, but we are, um, as I say, fully committed to honoring the agreement that we make for overflow parking. And um, I think you can move on. Yeah, Brian, you're up next, but maybe we want to take a break and answer any questions at this point. Really quick, I just had a quick question for you. Would you be taking down the tennis courts? The, the um, idea right now, so right now we have 13 tennis courts there. Uh, six of those courts are varsity courts. They're not open to the public. And seven of them are actually open to the general Vassar community as well as to the public. Our idea is that we want to uh, relocate the varsity tennis uh, function to um, be closer to what is currently our um, athletic and fitness center, but maintain some tennis courts in this area because they are an amenity that the public is um, used to using and we feel is is valuable in that location. Um, so when you say move, would you be moving it back towards like the pool and the be, golf course, that yeah, area? That would, that would be the idea. We would have tennis courts up in that area instead. That's the general idea. And and right here, it's it's really, un, um, it's an unhappy situation sometimes for visiting teams and for our own players. There's no showers, there's no bathroom, there's no you know, place to get really a good uh, drink of water and stuff like that. So being closer to our other, there's not a place for an athletic trainer and that kind of thing. So being closer to right, the because, other, yeah. Yeah, because in your, at where the pool is, there's bathrooms, there's- right, Exactly. Everything's yep. up there. Okay, yeah, no, that makes sense. Okay. Marianne, could you break down again the number of tennis courts that you anticipate moving versus the ones you anticipate yeah, so I, I hate to use firm numbers and I hate I to understand. use the term. Yeah, I hate to use the term move because obviously we're not picking them up and moving. And um, but currently in this location, we have a total of 13 courts and six of those are varsity courts and seven are, uh, you know, open courts for general recreational use. Um, so we would uh probably leave at least you know i don't I want to say but we could leave anywhere from say four or and up in this location and it really depends on the site plan for this project and how we connect paths and so forth in the parking to uh, what's around it so we haven't gone through any kind of you know even preliminary design yet for it so um so you don't know how many square feet the building would be the new building we, we've done an internal programmatic analysis, but we haven't done a detailed uh, program analysis for that. So right now, we, we roughly, we believe it will be about a 20,000 gross square foot building. Would that be on one floor or two floors? The, the current idea is that it would be two floors. Okay, so again, have a, again, we have a 
Okay. We haven't designed it yet. <laughs> okay. Thank you. The location of that building, the only access to it is down College View Avenue. And I think, is it Fairmont, the other one coming in? Yes. Those are, well, especially College View is very busy now. Seven days a week, all day long. This is going to increase the trips quite a bit and traffic flow. Is anything being considered to help with that? Because that's a very busy street now. It's only going to get more congested. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we have to do the detailed um, study and evaluation ar around traffic in this area. Uh, one thing, and, and we are completely committed to um, taking that on if that's if that's a concern. One uh, one thing I just would note about this is that we do not anticipate that will it will increase the number of visitors to campus. So currently we have, you know, visitors that the number of visitors that we have per year you know, just having this new building isn't going to increase that number. But, um, and so it's not really increasing traffic flow into the campus. Um, and many of our visitors park in that north edge already as it is because we don't have parking in the center of campus. So it's, it's uncertain as to how this will change traffic flow. And I do think it is something that we um, have to investigate more fully if we care to understand the answer to that question. Marianne, yeah. can I ask a question? I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, um, Rocco. When you invite, say you know someone's coming to campus, either to go to admissions or wherever, do you invite them to come through a particular entrance of the campus? Like currently, would it be main, the main entrance, if they're gonna uh, be, you, you know, know, is there any communication like that to potential visitors? I'm, sh I'm sure people have different ways that they describe getting to campus at this point in time. Um, many, you know, there are first time visitors who love to come through the main gate. And that is that, you know, real aha moment. And in many ways, we don't want to lose that, you know, that prospective student who comes through main gate. And for some people seeing main building laid out in front of you is like, I'm coming to this school, you know, mm -hmm. and we don't want to lose that. So, you know, even with this building um, located on the north edge, it's very likely that people will still be coming through the main gate, but through directional signage, it's still much easier. It's a much easier location to have admissions near parking there. Right now, what happens is people come in through the main gate, they look for admissions, they find the building for admissions, but there's no place right. to park. And so then they go hunting for parking. By the time they find their parking spot at the north lot, they walk back to admissions, they're late for their session, oh, and then wait, their session is actually being held in another building because the current admissions building is too small. Right. So it's just a not a very inviting and um, gracious way to. Right, yeah, and, and my point being that if they continue to come in the way they have been coming in, it may not result in increased traffic down College View. Because right, exactly. I understand your point that there's no net increase expected by relocating yeah. these existing offices. Okay, That's thank true. you. Yep. Just a reminder, real quick, you know, this is really early on still, too. I mean, as we develop the plan itself, the building and all that traffic will be done at that point, and we'll do the full studies, and we'll be back before you guys to have a more detailed discussion of this as we really get into the meat of, of a design and concept. This is still very early on in the planning stages at Vassar. Um, yeah, I appreciate you sharing this with us so we have an idea of why you Say you couldn't move the into that area because you know you know you don't have an application in to us yet for this but but uh, you've you've obviously given it quite a bit of thought already uh i had a question can or whoever can answer i see two red arrows there on the top is that some kind of alignment thing going on or a that's the existing gate i think that's the existing isn't it gate. yes yeah. that's the existing that's right. gate that's just Correct. okay that's just yeah. I'm trying to picture where fairmont avenue is versus Fairmont is Your right gate. to the left of that. Um, you can see it's Correct. not it's uh, not shaded. It's in white with just the uh, outline. Okay, right there. got it. Yeah, got it. That's fair okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Anyone uh, on the board have some questions, additional questions and comments on this? Is there any new news on the Yenin Institute? Any changes? Anything? that this workshop should address? 
Um, I think the next topic we wanted to bring up was the uh, the zoning. So do we want to talk through that, um, Brian? Actually, before we go on, I'm going to flip back a few pages. We didn't actually ask for feedback on the updated parking. And so that was one of the kind of bigger changes related to the project. So I apologize as I scan back through and maybe we can get a little bit of feedback of whether you uh, all believe this is uh, an improvement in the way that the parking is laid out and the way that it is aligned the two streets here and pulled the parking away from the nearby neighbor houses. Um, and whether this, like I said, whether this is valuable and we should continue to enhance it and get into the details of it or if you like the other version better. I think I like this version better. Definitely. I agree. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Rocco. I got a, a couple of questions about that. Uh, in your previous plan, you had the significant use of the valet parking. Is that still the case here? It is. It'll be on this lower level where a lot of that would end up taking place in this version. Okay. So it, it and, still meets the full parking plan that we submitted. Okay. And one of the comments I had regarding valet was whether or not uh, it would it would be available to people who uh, uh, shop uh, at the farmer's market when that's in a session. And uh, the answer I th thought I'd heard at that time was yes. Is that still the case? Yeah, when the farmer's market is in session, there will be valet here. Okay, and, and uh, is there, uh, this ties into, I don't know if you're gonna speak about that, but I, I about this, but I do recall that uh, you had some funds uh, set aside to, to promote or to advertise uh, the farmer's market uh, over a period of time. Is that is that still in place? Yeah, part of the conversation with the town is some funds allocated towards um, uh, Parks and Recreation is, I can't think of the exact name of the group, okay. so that they can promote activities here, yes. Well, what I was getting to is, uh, uh, I was looking for an appropriate uh, way to uh, uh, get the word out to, to the public that the valet parking would be available to them and whether or not that would be an appropriate way to do that or, or whether you could have a, a separate uh, campaign because uh, I know the, uh, the that the farmer's market's got a limited uh, time span uh, and, and hopefully it will grow over time and uh, with, uh, with, your, uh, with the promotional activities which you guys have uh, planned that might uh, help but to make that happen. And then uh, you get more people and there would be more need uh, for the valet parking. I, I, know, I know it's only in place for a year and then you're going to, to reevaluate it if I remember correctly what was said. Yes, right. So I would think that that would be, in my mind, that that would be a, uh, an important thing to let the the, uh, the public know that that is available to them, and and then how do you get the other word out? So uh, to answer sort of first part of the question, I like this plan uh, better, uh, and and then uh, my other uh, comments with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Rocco. Um, yeah, I like this parking plan better as well. The fact that it's further from the neighbor it gives you opportunity for the additional landscaping there as well. And the valet parking is you know, closer into the, to the inn as well and further from residential. Thank you. Anyone else have any comments on the parking? Before we leave here, um, I know just before this was when you talked about the open space, uh, Brian. So, you, um, so it sounds like the, the college is committed to working with us on some type of a, uh, whether it's an easement or you know some mechanism for ensuring that that then becomes uh, remains open space uh, available for the community. You know, kind of the way it has been. Um, but is that uh, correct? to say that's right yeah mike it's mike it's peter wise hey peter how um, you doing uh i think i think the simple answer is mike that we'll probably do for this the same kind of thing that we did for the great lawn at hudson heritage mm -hmm. which is to 
to work with you on, a, on an appropriate uh, declaration of restrictive covenants and then record that uh, instrument in the county clerk's office. Okay, okay great. Thank you. Any uh, comments from board members on that? On the lawn? Preservation? Um, I'll, I'll speak up. I think I really appreciate it. I recognize that it's a, a big concession on the part of the college, and I really appreciate that offer. So just, those are my comments. Thank yeah, you. I second that. Uh, you. Yeah, this is wrong. Yeah. So, uh, I agree with that uh, entirely. Thank you. Yeah, Thank I you. agree as well. Same here. Sounds Thank you. Like, sounds like uh, everybody, everybody appreciates that because that yeah, that was a, definitely a, an issue that people were concerned about it being built upon further and then pushing the farmer's market out somewhere else. So having something available for the farmer's market uh, forever there is a great thing, as well as just uh, right. as a pseudo community park. Well, so it's going to be a nice green really for Arlington. I mean, it's, it's right. kind of the, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it becomes something that's actually formalized and as a, as a public, you know, community mm -hmm. shared space in, in some fashion, which I think yep. will be uh, great long term. And just back to your uh, proposal on the North Edge campus, I think that's a great uh, door into the campus as well, as you said, because that if visitors are in that area, they're frequenting the, the businesses in Arlington there as well as the, the your bookstores there. It's uh, mm -hmm. everything seems to be on that one location for walkability and uh, just moseying around to see things. Yeah. I just want to point out we have about 15, 20 minutes uh, remaining. We kind of nope. had a hard stop because okay. some people had to leave uh, around 6:30. So mm -hmm. I want to give make sure that they have time to get to their. Yeah last item Let's get to the zoning I now. think it's the last item I don't know all right <laughs> unless the group brings something else up okay which we would happily happy to talk about absolutely yeah. so uh the last being this is the same text amendment that's been proposed because we didn't get a chance to really talk about it um in the meeting get feedback from the board uh we're proposing adding a new definition to the zoning code for a conference university conference center or college university conference center uh really for providing activities that are consistent with the educational mission for a higher education institution and you know focus on educational activities and it would then amend the zoning code to make this a permitted use in the institutional zone subject to being on property owned by college university uh, again offering activities which are consistent with the educational mission being within walking distance to a town center maximum number of rooms and containing a restaurant that can be open to the public so um we, as i said we didn't get really get a chance to talk about this at the last meeting so we wanted to provide an opportunity for feedback uh, or questions if there are any mm -hmm. may contain a restaurant right yes, to, yeah don't want that to be a, a must right. uh, I, I have a question this may be for lisa um i have notes that say for this uh, type of zoning change, we the seeker analysis would require its impact on all educational institutions. Is that something that we would have to, like Maris, for example, would we then have to? The the seeker analysis would take into effect all of the properties in the institutional district that this would affect. Okay. So yes, the short answer is yes. Okay, thank you. Which is one of the reasons we talked about this as a type one seeker action, because otherwise it might be an unlisted action, but because it has the potential to affect lands that are more than 25 acres, it needs to be classified as a type one. And, the, and some of these restrictions means it cannot be applied to any institutional uh, area in the town, it, only certain ones that meet these requirements. I'm trying to remember, uh, Brian, I don't know if you, uh, I just don't have it in front of me, but it was the, the use itself was going to be a permitted use or a special permitted use? Do we, um, do you recall? I think it's a special permitted use okay. in the proposal. Okay. I thought, I, that's what I was thinking I, I remembered, but it's been a few months. <laughs> so, yeah, so that, would, that needs yeah. an additional planning board approval then for yeah. that. 
Right. So one of the things that um, the board will be considering is there will be conditions attached to it as a special use because, as you know, special uses are permitted generally, provided that the use meets whatever the criteria are they're set forth in the code. So for this example, one of the things that was taught, you know, it's talking about that it may have a restaurant, but it can have, for example, a maximum of 60 rooms. And there were, so there were size limitations on it. One of the other things that was worked through when this definition was arrived at was limiting it to a college slash university conference center so that we were not creating a use to allow just general conference centers and all the attendant issues that they may have in the institutional district but this would be specifically tied to a college or university. And it also then eliminates the, you know, no secondary institutions, high schools, other schools will do this and no other, it's strictly within this college university setting. Uh -huh. Lisa, so like, um, for example, Oakwood, um, it would not apply to like a prepared, a, I don't even know what Oakwood is, honestly, high, but, um, right. Would, so this would not apply to that type of educational right it would not be a permitted use for that because the thought was um, when the code section was being worked on that it was not something that the town would want more broadly available they think it's something that would benefit a college or university but not necessarily the benefits to other educational institutions would not be outweighed by the potential detriment to the town by the added things so the thought was to limit it to colleges or universities okay thank you Anyone else ha on the board have questions on the zoning text? I like that it's restrictive to, to certain places, so that that gives us uh, gives it more teeth. Yep. So, can I ask a question for if this is the if the review is going to extend out to all um, college? or a, a institutional use, like for the seeker review, does that, um, like for public notice for future, does that then kind of expand the field of folks who would be looking at this from the public's perspective? Like does this then implicate like communities around Marist? Like, is it gonna sort of, I'm just curious as to how this could potentially unfold in terms of the review process and feedback from the public. Does that so make sense, it, that question? Yeah. I'm sorry? I just didn't know if that question even made sense. I'm just oh, sort of sure. thinking so, out loud, I think. Um, this has been listed in all of the public hearings as, I believe, as a change to this district, uh, the institutional district, so that it is something that should be on everyone's radar okay. um, and whether or not, um, you know, and I believe that we have information in our packets from Vassar at this point about um, the, imp the seeker impacts on that because I think the scope of their seeker review provided some information for us about that. Okay. <laughs> um, that's my dog in the background. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's not your not, stomach, we'll make, Lisa. <laughs> if not, we will make sure that that is part of um, a future review so the board has all the information it needs in order to do a seeker determination about the global possibilities of this. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions from board members on any topics they did not present tonight? I want to make sure that your questions are answered because this is a workshop for, for looking at the Senior Institute primarily. I, I have a question. Um, do we know what the status is of the new master plan? I have notes indicating that, and I'm sure with COVID, everything's been uh -huh. slowed down dramatically, um, but is there any updates on that or is it still, yes. you know, yeah. Yeah. it's like, not gonna be tomorrow, so really just focus on existing. Right, yeah. um, the, the the plan, uh, we do have a draft. Uh, we have been working through COVID, um, actually, you know, made quite a lot of progress. We do have a draft of the plan uh, that the committee has reviewed uh, and provided some feedback to our consultants on. The consultants are, you know, revising and, and you know, cleaning up that document so that Hopefully sometime after uh, February, we'll be able to you know, have something that the committee feels comfortable releasing out to the public. There'll be a public workshop. 
And then ultimately it has to still go to the town board, so you know, for, for the formal adoption process. So, you know, I think a lot of the ideas you'll be able to see uh, in, the, mm -hmm. in, in that document, you know, starting in, in, in hopefully maybe March. Um, but again, the, the document will not be the official plan for the town until I, I you know, I would right. say sometime right. in the summer, maybe. Right along, yeah. 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 Well, the town has to have their own public hearings on it as well once they. Oh, yes. yeah. They yeah. Okay. Then All right. And then it. lastly, I have notes about um, the topic of taxes for this property. I don't know if the applicant can speak to whether there's been any further conversations with the town about any agree agreements about the taxable status of the property. Brian, you're so this is Brian, I, I can address that. We had uh, some preliminary conversations with the town and, and I think had a framework of how we might approach it. And then we were waiting for the planning board process to advance to finish that up. So um, I think if, if coming out of this, we have addressed a number of the concerns and questions that the planning board has, we will probably get back to that. Um, okay. One of our questions before we leave is next step and whether we should resubmit with these changes and, and then reopen the public hearing or if there are other things that we should be spending time getting into. Yeah, that's why I was trying to open it up if anyone, every, anyone has any other things that were not addressed tonight. Uh, members of the board. Or, members of the board, yes. yes. <laughs> not uh, public. I, I have to say, Brian, you, you guys did a great job. I like everything that I saw and I heard, except I have concerns about the constriction of that street. I understand I might be one of the only people that has concerns about that. And maybe maybe the residents would like it to be like that. Um, I, just, I, I just don't want it to happen and then be in a situation where that um, increases traffic and becomes a, a traffic problem. You know, we we want it to not be a problem, so I'm I'm just a little concerned about um, what I saw tonight. That's all. Um, according to, you know, your uh, your traffic. Well, I think you know. Uh, so in terms of next steps, I think there's kind of two ways you could approach that, Brian. One would be, you know, obviously it sounds like you've done a little bit of outreach um, on the street, um, and uh, you know, hopefully that's been helped you know it sounds like it's already informed some of what your thinking is uh and uh so maybe you would do a little more of that that's up to you obviously the the public hearing our expectation would be the next time you come back we would open the public hearing uh again and and, and you know that would also be an opportunity for people to provide some feedback but i, I i'm i'm thinking you probably you know would want to have a little better sense of how those things are going to be received so that you know that's kind of and kind of have to leave that up to you. Um, you know, I, I do think overall it's probably going to improve the quality of life for most people on that street to have right. the traffic slowed down and, and the aesthetics improved. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I think uh, people would probably want to know a little more <clears throat> detail. And so I think the outreach that you've been doing probably, you know, is a good way to go. It, it just to me seems a little bit of an overkill, that's all. Well, uh, this is this is Eric, and I'll just suggest maybe for the next time or beyond that, um, there's a traffic analysis that's been on the books for a while. If the configuration of the road is changing, it might be worth having your consultant take a look at that analysis and address if there are going to be improvements made to the roadway to have your consultant out of the box address what those changes would mean mean with regard to the traffic analysis, which at the last point of view seemed to be indicate adequacy uh, to see mm -hmm. whether or not a, a different configuration that is yet to be proposed has any effect on those results. Great, thank you. Thanks, Eric. Yeah. Well, if it slows traffic down, people won't have to leave their driveway at 50 miles an hour. Yep. <laughs> In general, when you when you uh, make a street, I mean, that's what we're trying to do to Main Street as well. It, it's a complete streets project and trying to make it more pedestrian friendly and slow traffic down a little bit. And that's kind of a similar idea here, here I think. So, as well as provide some additional parking uh, on street. 
right, that's guess... the goal. But as as Nicole pointed out, we don't want to do this if it's not helpful. So we will oh, get a little certainly. more feedback on that to help yeah. refine it. Yeah. yeah, need to have some buy-in there. Uh, is there any other questions from board members on the in and institute before they come back with another application? Can I just um, confirm with the applicant that at this point you're not offering any changes to the design of the, the structure? Uh, not at this time. We okay. did make some changes last time, and I think we can revisit the you know conversation around connection to the community and talk about you know if, if there's still disconnect on that. Okay. All right. No one's here, but the air is still here. Uh, again, if you're uh, on the Zoom, if you could mute yourself, please, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so, Brian uh, or Ken, uh, or is there anything else you need to, uh, questions you have for the board? I mean, it sounds like I think we've had a pretty good dialogue uh, around these ideas. Um, so I think you did get quite a bit of feedback, which is what the intent of tonight is. Mm -hmm. Um, in general, uh, the, in general, is positive changes that I've saw throughout uh, to the plan. So, yes, thank you very much. I mean, this has been very helpful. We'll we'll start working on the document for the lawn. Um, you know, getting more detailed on the parking, get a little bit more feedback on the um, the traffic from the local community, and refine that a bit more. Um, I'm looking through my notes here. Uh, I think that was where the big hitters and what we talked about today, and for have that ready for the next uh, application. Uh, I didn't remember here any, if anyone had any comments about the, you know, the, the, they discussed the the way they're preserving the history of Williams with some with uh, some uh, walkthroughs and such. Did anyone have any questions or comments about that? Any board members? All right. Uh, I did see that you, uh, I, I did see John Pinna recently in, in town hall here, and he did mention that you've uh, reached out, so appreciate that. Um, I think, you know, anything you can do to, uh, with them, in partnership with them to, uh, you know, uh, would be would be appreciated, um, would, be, would be helpful. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, we will do. All right, thanks everyone. I think we're coming up to a hard stop uh, on time here. All right, so thank you all. Really ideas. appreciate the time. Uh, and Brian, have a good night. thanks, everyone. Brian. Have a good evening, Brian. Yeah, I'm listening. Yeah, this is question totally unrelated to any of this. But are you, you have a relative named Ed Swarthout? I don't actually. I mean, maybe distantly, but not.